And don't tread on me either. <laughs> All right, one more time. A little louder. <laughs> hey, and don't tread on me either. People have given up hope in this country. What do you think we can do to give them some hope back? It's time to start kicking ass and taking names. Don't tread on me. One more time. Don't tread on me. All right, scream it. Don't tread on me. Wake up, America. It's time to fight for liberty. Don't tread on me is the line. That is the line where we define who we are. We are giving you a warning. Uh, federal government, we are giving you a warning. Totalitarians, we are giving you a warning. Statists, that we are getting to the point where we will be striking back with lethal force. And you do not want that. So you do not wish to tread on us. Does that, does, does that vilify or legitimize the concern that the federal government has about militias? What? Kicking ass and taking names? If we start to shoot back. Oh, look. We can't let it get to that point. We cannot let it get to that point. I'm sure that they've said that a million times during the Revolutionary War and the war before that and every other one that we've had. But unfortunately, reality is, is that throughout history, tyrants don't give up their power willingly. If the government we organize under the people's constitution survives the next 20 years, it may go on forever. My friend, it will survive. What are our obligations of citizenship? Number one, to understand the American way of life and what makes it fit. For instance, we should understand that our form of government is a republic, not a pure democracy. A pure democracy establishes majority rule with a minority overrun. Yes, it does. On the other hand, our republic is based on a constitution which protects minority rights. And it's important, too, that in our republic, authority is surrounded by an ingenious system of checks and balances that prevents autocratic or dictatorial rule. That is, if we maintain the Constitution as our basic law. You've just come from the Constitutional Convention. What have we got? A republic or a monarchy? A republic, if you can keep it so. You have been warned. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When President George W. Bush was confronted over the fact that he was violating the Fourth Amendment with his warrantless wiretapping of the American people under the Patriot Act, he famously said that, well, the Constitution is just a GD piece of paper. And it is just a piece of paper unless we animate the Bill of Rights and Constitution and Declaration of Independence. If we don't exercise these rights, like muscles, they atrophy, they rot, they fall away. It is we the people that empower the Bill of Rights and Constitution. For a long time, people forgot the Bill of Rights and Constitution, and it was dying on the vine. But now we see that new life is being breathed into it, and that a revolution of freedom is burning in the minds of men and women everywhere. This is very exciting. And as a society, as a species, as a planet, we're at a crossroads. Will we have a 1984 society, or will we rediscover the true values that made us great and go back to that spirit of 1776? That's why I have said many times that the answer to 1984 is 1776. The human sovereign, if you will, we the people. And that's what the Constitution tells us. We the people do ordain and establish this. The public officials didn't do that. The judges didn't do that. We the people did it. Well, that's a statement that we the people have the authority to do it. We are the ultimate law givers because the ultimate law, at least the ultimate human law in our system, is the Constitution, and we the people created it. We the people gave birth to government. We are the masters of government, and they are the subjects of the people. A lot of people blame the Bill of Rights and Constitution. They blame our system of government for the oppressive corruption that we're living under. It's not the fault of the Bill of Rights and Constitution. It's the fault of we the people for letting government grow into this gargantuan, sprawling system that it is. It's our fault 
for not holding government officials accountable and by letting government officials call themselves officials. They are public servants. We the people constitute the government. We the people are the boss. And when the government becomes destructive of the Constitution, of the Bill of Rights, it is not just our job and our right, it is our duty to remove that government. And most of these problematic pieces of legislation and laws that get enacted are done without the people's knowledge. Some of it's even done without legislators' knowledge. And so they don't go to the people and say, hey, what do you think about having to carry an ID card around and show that card before you can travel and, and do all kinds of things? The idea of constitutionality becomes kind of fuzzy when you talk at the state level because the states were intended to be autonomous. So therefore, uh, whatever they put in their state constitution is whatever their state constitution is. For example, in Illinois, their Second Amendment, uh, most Second Amendments just say the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Illinois state constitution says subject to police powers, these, these rights shall not be infringed. So in Illinois, anti-gun laws are constitutional. In Missouri, they're not. The bill, House Bill Number 246, is uh, an act exempting from federal regulation under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution of the United States a firearm, a firearm accessory, or ammunition manufactured and retained in Montana and providing an applicability date. Um, so it's basically they're trying to exempt themselves from the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause is what the federal government uses for everything. If it, if it, if, if the state if it, gets out of line? Yeah. This is what they used to pull them back in. Anything. In Missouri, it just says if the firearms and the ammunition are made here, what's made here and stays here is not subject to the national government's commerce clause. They've used this commerce clause to interfere with everything they choose. And it's time for us to say, no, if we make it here, it has to be stamped on the gun, made in Missouri. We're very proud of that. And that says, get your hands off. Tonight, states are stepping up to protect their residents' Second Amendment rights from what they see as the long arm of Washington. Under a new state law starting next month, any gun made in Montana, sold to a Montana resident, and remaining in that state will be exempt from federal control. Congress does have the power to regulate interstate commerce, but I think that was the specific intent. That is to say, the Congress has the power to regulate the way trade occurs between the states and also to regulate the way trade occurs outside of states in commerce with other nations. But this interstate commerce clause has been interpreted so broadly as to literally affect every aspect and phase of American life. That is the loophole that uh, has been used to so uh, dramatically broaden the application of federal power far beyond the intent of the framers of the Constitution. But when the federal government comes in and says, we want to be your daddy, we want to tell you how to live your life, that's where we draw the line and say, whoa, not in Montana. And the feeling among many there is that the thing to fear the most is not a person with a gun, but a government that would take that gun away. Well, the meaning of the Second Amendment is found in its actual words, a well-regulated militia being necessary to security a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms to not be infringed. Now, you notice that structure if we ask what's the most important point in the Second Amendment, well, it's the object, and the object is the security of a free state. Right? And the first thing that the amendment tells us is that something called a well-regulated militia is necessary to that purpose. And the second thing it tells us is that something called the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Why? Because it's connected in some way to a well-regulated militia, which is connected directly, as the amendment tells us, to the security of a free state. Well, the Second Amendment was written just to make sure we wouldn't have bad people come in and try and rob us of our rights. The bottom line is that's the only last hope there is if people are trying to do harm to our nation. Well, the whole reason we have the Second Amendment in there, a lot of people understand this, but a lot of people either never do or have forgotten, is to protect ourselves against